welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. Today, I am so excited to be joined by one of my longtime friends and colleagues, Robin Anderson. She is a social media consultant and content creator based in Missouri, with a focus on helping nonprofits, mission-oriented groups, and service-based community organizations. She assists her clients in crafting their message to make a meaningful impact. And with her expertise in social media and content creation, Robin enables her clients to effectively communicate and achieve their goals. She is also a multi-passionate freelance musician, singer, pianist, teacher, composer, singer-songwriter, recording artist, and arts advocate. And I've been able to see her shine in all of those roles, and I must say she is a force to be reckoned with, and I am delighted to have her on the show today. That's so kind of you. Although hearing my name now and hearing you read all that, I'm like, man, I did not niche down until recently. (laughs) Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, you know, that's okay about um, finding your way and doing all those other wonderful creative pursuits. Yes. And understanding how it all leads to into something new and into something different, a different trajectory, if you will. So it's all becoming clear. The social media has made it clear for me. And yeah, everything plays into everything else. I, I would love to backtrack a little bit. I know that obviously you, when I knew you, you were doing music and music education, but you know, how, not only how did you get to there, but how did you decide to pivot to social media um, all these years later? So we knew each other in the music education degree in our master's program. I think you were in your master's as well, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So I, something I keep coming back to over the years is the thought that any profession, I'll speak to music because, and creatives, because that's your audience within any profession, there's decisions that you have to make right along the way. And you, the more experience you have and the more work you do, the more you come to learn what you don't want to do. <laughs> That's not always clear from the get-go. And when I think back to our education classes, specifically with our um, loved mentor and um, what that mentor said at to me individually at one point in time, she was my academic advisor and I think she was for you maybe, but um, you know, I sat down with her in her office. Everything comes to this moment. Sat down with her in her office and I was like, I don't think I want to be a music teacher. <laughs> <laughs> after I had been in a music program and had music teaching experience in public schools and voice teaching experience. And she was like, well, that's okay. I was terrified, you know, in when you're young and you have no idea what you want to do and it becomes more and more clear what you don't want to do. That moment when she said, well, just because you have a music education degree does not mean you have to go teach. I hold on to that. <laughs> and it's carried through all of the creative endeavors that I've had. Um, So I started off teaching privately and I taught middle school and music. I taught voice and music appreciation and courses in academia and higher ed. Through that kind of, there was an outcropping (laughs) 2.0 career of recording and touring and um, playing with organizations professionally, singing, both singing and and writing for and performing with, doing the festival circuit. And then out of that outcropping, there there kind of came a resting point to that. And that was (laughs) very obviously when I had children because we have small children and the evening and weekends, they kind of go away. Like I can't commit to variable schedules. I really have to kind of know 
in something has to be steady in order to accommodate the ever shifting needs of the family, right? So, um, I, in during that time period, I started working for, and I had been working for several nonprofits along the way, mostly music, and um, I had a music video made and a, a guy who, who made my music video and produced it started a film nonprofit. So I started working for that as uh, an outreach coordinator and development co coordinator, which really put to use um, kind of my, I don't know, my skills in education and organization and facilitation and arts administration. That was kind of the, the pivot into arts administration. And it was for them that I, I was doing the digital media and doing social media. And that piece of it, like being in a niche that you don't quite understand, don't fully understand, because film is not my thing, you know, music is. But working alongside similar creatives that are doing the creative process and living it and doing it through um, nonprofit mission work, mission-based work, and understanding how to tell their story to other people because first of all, you have to understand it yourself. But in order to tell their story and the stories that they are creating, it's all very meta. <laughs> the stories that they are creating through their digital media, because they're photographers and filmmakers and podcasters. That was the piece of it that became clear to me that I was able to do, is to tell other people's story and to distill it in information that... Um, at least attempts to wholly communicate what it is they're doing and to be able to help them bring that story to life on social media in a way that speaks to the audience and pulls them into their circle. I became very good at that very quickly. <laughs> Just toot my own horn. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to because I didn't understand film and I didn't know how to talk about it, right? So I started doing social media for, and along the way I had been doing social media for the various organizations and nonprofits, like my my private band work, my musician page. Um, at some point, my personal profile became a digital creator profile. And that's a whole, there's a whole story behind that. And I started making money at it <laughs> on the platforms. And it's, you know, it's coffee money, but it's money. <laughs> and um, that's kind of how I, and then I just decided to start formalizing my process and actually understanding the um, marketing know-how and prowess behind social media. So hashtags and captioning and content creation and being able to do a bulk, like to create a lot of content for a lot of people very quickly. So that that became my, my formal process in the last year. And now I'm making money, <laughs> which is always a win, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's always nice when you're able to do something that you enjoy and that you are curious about and then it actually turns a profit because it's like icing on the cake it's like oh okay well this is cool I can yes. you know save a little more for my kids college funds or you know yes. take that vacation I didn't think about or you know whatever that's exactly right and I just love when I get to the point where it becomes my steady revenue stream and, and that's always like the 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 story of pivoting has always been that I pivot gently into one area and then it becomes like this fully functioning um, leg to stand on financially that contributes to all the and helps support the other things that I do that maybe don't don't bring in as much revenue like recording or streaming. So it's been a really nice way to plug in creatively and to help other people because I want other people's stories known. I want like my music friends. I want you. I want the nonprofits that I work for, I mean, social proof is so like necessary. It's absolutely necessary, not just for the nonprofits, it's for grants for, and funding purposes. But mm -hmm. for us, it's like, if we don't talk about what we're doing. <laughs> Does the tree fall in the woods? What is that saying? I don't know. But if we don't talk about what we're doing and nobody hears or sees it, what are we doing? <laughs> I'm curious, what, what do you think the next year or two is going to look like for your business? It's interesting you ask that because niching down from the get-go within the sphere of social media has helped me take off in a way that I didn't understand was going to be a thing. Like work just exploded in the last six months. And I think niching down helps because I, I know 
what it is to podcast. I'm not saying I had a, this like uber, uberly successful podcast, but I understand the processes behind it and I know how to help those people. I understand the processes behind running a private music studio. So I know how to help those people talk about their story. I understand music nonprofits, theater nonprofits, dance nonprofits, and to some extent, arts nonprofits. So niching down helped right away. And because of the way I operate, <laughs> may or may not be the healthiest, but with everything, every pivot, every moment kind of begins with this brainchild of an idea. And my master brainchild that preempted this, all of this, the pivot into social media was, you know, putting my brain on this master, master list, content list of th anything that a podcaster, a musician, a music therapist, a, a theater nonprofit, all of those kind of like two audience subsets, creatives and nonprofits to assemble this master master list of anything that they would want to talk about on social media, anything and anything that would adequately demonstrate their story and what they're, what they're doing. So I put my brain on this and went into this hyper binge creation mode <laughs> and um, put that together. And now when someone comes to me and says, I need help, I don't know what to post on social media, even though you're doing the work. I'm like, you have so much content. I say this to people as they come to me, but Here's my master list, and here are the 15 things that I think you should talk about. So all that is to say that I think this next year is going to be um, – it's going to move very quickly and be very fruitful for many people. But I have in my mind that the work that we put into, the front-loading work that I put into this, I would love to be able to – um, market that individually and, you know, sell it as right now I'm leaning into it for the coaching service. But the, my core content is this master brainchild, this content for these people. And I'm leaning into it now via coaching. I think in the next year, I would love to have a goal of like launching that as a product and launching it as something that people can just download and have. And then because of the way that I've set up my my model, my sustainability model, if you will, <laughs> to use nonprofit speak, is that they don't have to keep hiring me over and over again. That's what people cannot afford to do. We cannot afford to do that. I do work for one company that does that, but I mean, no, most nonprofits and independent DIY creatives cannot afford $1,000 a month for ongoing social media management. But this model does. It allows that to happen. So that's kind of where I'm going. That's what I envision for the next year. Within that, there's like 15 different ways that I could do that. <laughs> you know, I gave you a plan for podcasting. So it's like, do I release it for podcasters? And is all of my content for the next year going to be marketed toward that? Or is it just like a broader, more creative, like a template for creatives? So that's kind of where I'm, where I am right now in, in determining my content. But the beautiful thing is it's reverse engineered. It's already done. <laughs> I just nice. have to talk about it. So yeah, yeah. I, Sorry, I just that was had very a very long winded. It's okay. I just had a brainstorm and feel free to like not use yes. it. But I think it would be so great if you had for download your models, your spreadsheets, you know, podcaster, mm -hmm. music teacher, etc. And people could create their own like package. Custom. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. You know, especially for the people that cross pollinate, like you are a to you, a music teacher, a music therapist, but you're also a podcaster. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just whatever, however people want to represent themselves. I think for me, this digital media has shown me how to delineate my myself as a person versus myself, my musician pursuits versus my pursuits and like how to delineate that, you know, on social media, what gets its own treatment. And so for the people that do so many things that wear many hats, creative hats, yeah, it would be cool to kind of be like, actually, I want to, I want 30% podcasting prompts and, you know, 50% music education prompts. And, and then you can kind of decide where to plug those in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good idea. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also available for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, goodness. Funny. So, um, Talk to me more about your creative process, whether it's with songwriting or with social media content. You know, what are some things you love, some things you 
really don't want to have to deal with, you know, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have learned over the years that I cannot do everything myself. So I am learning to how to outsource and where I do not want to spend my time. Mm-hmm. So I think starting there has made, has accelerated my creative process. Very broadly, I just, I, ideas come to me and I try to, to write them down um, in my everyday life. I use notes, I use voice memos, and it's always a joy to like go through the voice memos and be like, (laughs) voice memo 1,800 and whatever. And I'm like, well, which one was this about? Where was that one little snippet that I put about that one little song? Anyway, so I do a lot of voice memos and um, thought jotting, I guess, for lack of a better word. And I have those, or not so much in voice memos, but in notes app um, or reminders apps, I have them kind of organized by my creative pursuits. So if I have an idea for a podcast, it goes into that list. If I have an idea for a song, a hook, a melody, it goes into my songwriting list. And I have about four or five of those. And sometimes they get abandoned, like I said, but (laughs) you pivot into, you lean into what you're doing. That's kind of where it starts for me. I used to, when I had, I guess, the luxury of, of, the season in my life when I had the luxury of sitting down and being like, I'm going to spend an hour and really just let the the thoughts come and flow. I don't do that as much anymore. And I find that it doesn't come to me that way anymore. It really doesn't. So if I have a thought, it tends to kind of be whole and I'm only recording. Like I have the idea, the overall thing in my mind from the get-go, but I tend to only record a small bit of that and then flesh it out later because I already know in my head, I already know the entirety or or generally what it looks like and, or sounds like or feels like. Deciding what template to put it in. So is it a song? Is it a tiny video for my social media? Is it this, this or that? And in the flesh out process, I know, for instance, in songwriting, I do not want to do the mixing and mastering and recording. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to learn. I'm not going to spend time learning that, even though I think it would contribute to my skills, but I'm not going to put my time and efforts there because however much per hour for an hourly rate, I can just have someone else do it. (laughs) And it gets me toward my goal faster. In digital media, I have realized I do not want to spend a lot of time in research. And you would think, oh, like, Again, it all comes <laughs> hand in hand, the research piece of it. You wouldn't think you need to research a lot for social media. But if you don't know a niche, you do have to do research and you have to confirm statistics and you have to confirm advice and make sure that it's actually correct. I don't want to spend my time there. <laughs> so I have a person that I outsource that to and she's a researcher kind of like you or like I was, but I just outsource it and I say, find find this and make sure it's correct. And she spits it back to me in an hour and it's good to go. (laughs) So there's bits and pieces for every creative pool that I spend my time in that I will not spend my time in, if that makes sense. And that helps propel me toward a finished product. I think if I had a, it's a fault, but I try to, I want to create something. I want it to live somewhere. I want it to be, when I create something, I I want it to be done Like I want it to be iterated, I guess I should say, because nothing is ever done, I feel. But I want it to be, to put it on its feet and I want to see it succeed and live somewhere. So I'm always kind of working with that in mind too. It's just to what, at what point can I put a pin in this and let it live as my body of work in songwriting or my body of work in digital media for nonprofits. So that's me as a human I realize that a lot of other creatives don't work that way and that's okay. It sounds like you really relish the quote unquote finished product and that sort of motivates you to go start something else so that you can have another finished product. Yes. And while I know no, like nothing is ever wholly complete. I just consider it a representative enough of the thought that I had from the beginning in order to share it with somebody to inspire them to do the same thing. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. It does not, I'm done with perfection. I'm done with that. (laughs) I I do want my work to feel and look good and be representative of the time that I spend on it, but I'm not, I don't, 
I tend not to let my ideas live too long in a somewhere. And it makes me feel inadequate, Tammy. <laughs> it makes me feel like I have all of these ideas that never went somewhere because I couldn't make them go somewhere. Right. So I do, I do relish the thought of just getting, moving it to a finish line, whatever I decide that finish line is. I completely understand about um, wanting to finish products because I have, or projects rather, I have so many, as I've talked about before on my podcast, so many half written <laughs> book manuscripts, um, <laughs> things like and that. And that's okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they're, they're always representative of what we were thinking at a moment in time, right? So yeah. it, I've come to understand too, that if something is not done, that's okay. It just means that I might be done with it. Yeah. I might not want to spend my time on it right now. And that's okay. <laughs> yep. There's only so much time. And I love the fact that you delegate where you're able to, because it does free up our brains, frees up our lives so that we can dedicate it to do other things that are a little bit more of a priority, whether it's something creative or something personal. Yes, absolutely. And there's so many tools now in the digital age to outsource work where you need that to me, I'm like, why am I sitting, going down a YouTube rabbit hole, trying to figure out how to do a tiny plugin in Logic? I'm like, why am I doing this? This is not what I want to do. Anyway. <laughs> um, if we could sort of deep dive a little bit on a more serious topic, I was wondering what mm -hmm. kind of barriers have you had to get to where you are? It's such a heavily loaded question. Two come to mind. One of them is both a barrier and a catalyst, I suppose I should say. And that's having children. <laughs> I love my children, but everything changes. And um, it's all a delicate balancing act of, you know, rearing humans the way that in those, are, especially in those early years. And I'm learning now as my younger or my my oldest progresses out of, you know, into kindergarten and into that school age phase that everything is a phase, but it catalyzed at the same time, it catalyzed my creative output. It like froze it and then it catalyzed it because everything had to work within that new structure, the new family structure, the new, oh, I can't just say yes to gigs even though I get gig requests all the time now, can you do this this weekend, a wedding or a funeral? I'm like, I can't do that. I don't, it's not there. <laughs> I can't, I can't just commit, um, you know, late like that. So that is one that comes to mind, the children. And then the other is really more self-imposed and that is perfectionism. <laughs> and, um, the personal, I feel like any constraints that I have ever had on my creative process, on producing, on making, has all they've always been personal. Like very few of them have been have ever been um, you know, I have that privilege. I know that's a privilege, but very few of them have been imposed by other people. It's always kind of me. <laughs> and so perfectionism in the sense that we we are our own worst critics. Every creative goes through that process where they feel really great about an idea. They get in the the trenches of it and they're like, this sucks. Who is going to understand or want to know this? And then we zoom back out again and you're actually proud of it. And that's why I feel like when I get into the trenches, I'm like, move past this, push past this to get it to a point where you are happy with it and then let it go. Because that other end of it is what you need to get to in order to feel good about creating. So for a very, very long time, I would get into that funnel, the very skinny part of the funnel and stop. I would just stop because I'm like, this is not, I didn't feel during that part of the creative process that anybody would want to, there was just a lot of anxiety and um, self-doubt, all of those things that the creatives live with. And that's all self-imposed you know, because when you do know your audience and you start creating something and putting it out there for the world, you find those people and they support it. And that's who you made it for. That's success. So yeah, perfectionism and anxiety, self-doubt, all of that kind of clouding into the uh, personal, um, yeah, mental barrier. So, but yeah, those are the two big ones, I think. Mm -hmm. And how do you say you been able to go past that or is it still something you struggle with in moments 
Um, both. I, I think it's something I still struggle with, but also the reframing of the narrative. I think that moving into digital media and doing this for, for other people has taught me that reframing what you see, what you feel and what other people see in your story may not be ever a line, but it actually could work in your favor. So what I saw in a fledgling film nonprofit that was starting in the height of COVID and what I was able to then speak to or speak about on social media was so different from the behind the scenes anxiety and um, doubts that this the people behind this driving this organization had. And at that same story is for every creative, every person. So in order to push past that, creating the narrative and reframing the narrative of, well, actually, here's your successes and here's your wins. And however little those are, they're not in insubstantial. And one of the pieces in content creation is affirmations, celebrating a win, um, polling your audience and asking them questions, because all of those things feed into your narrative. They all feed into reframing what you were doing. For instance, my children. Creating is very difficult. I don't do the thing where I have to go to sleep at by 10. I have to, because if I don't, I cannot function as a mother in the morning. <laughs> so I don't have that time late at night, you know, to be my night owl self like I was in my mid to late 20s before we had children. However, and it and for a while, I grieved that. But now I do not because I the catalyst of having to be like, well, that's not an option anymore for me personally. And, you know, if I really wanted to like kill myself, I guess I could do that. But why? Why would I do that? So now my option is to inject five minute creation periods throughout the day where I do have this idea and I'm taking a step forward and I'm moving, even if it is something like I used to think that there had to be like, you know, four to five hour chunks of time to sit down and create. And if I didn't have that, I felt unsuccessful. Well, nobody has that. Nobody. And not just mothers. So I'm sorry. What was the original question? I went so far left. <laughs> left okay. field. Oh, it, it, it was just about, you know, uh, more about the barriers and um, the barriers. And the yeah. Anxiety, just things like that. Yeah. yeah, I think that reframing the narrative for yourself is important. Um, and just understanding that, yeah, I have, I was a creator and now I am a creator with children and here's what it looks like, but mm -hmm. it's value neutral. There is nothing bad or good about either one of them. They're just different. And so coming to expect, um, to shift the expectations, to reframe your own narrative is what has helped me push past those barriers. For Excellent. sure. Excellent. So we talked a little bit about your creative process and your barriers, but what is one thing that you have learned in terms of overcoming and pivoting that you feel you could carry with you into whatever comes next? Creativity looks looks different from the outside. It will always feel the same. To me, I know I'm in the I've pivoted successfully when I hit that flow doing whatever it is, whatever new thing it is that I do. It feels the same. It feels like you are home, even if though you are might be in new territory. So that hitting the flow, I think, is the obvious thing for me. When I sit down and I create a social media strategy for a symphonic orchestra, I know that I'm right place because I look up and four hours later, it's done and I haven't even eaten or you know looked at the time or I don't I don't necessarily get that I did during my creative binge moment but like I said I don't have four to five hour chunks of time anymore but the flow the flow of it is where it happens and also helping people because we're all existing in this world and we all have our own unique skills and knowledge and when we pivot into a new area we are bringing with that we bring that with us and it only scaffolds the work that we do in a new field. It might look different from the outside, but it feels the same on the inside or better. It feels the same or better. So moving into digital media has felt like all of the, the greatest society because now I'm doing it to help other people 
who have done it and have not dig- have not pivoted into digital media. And that's a piece of it, helping helping other people. I love that. I definitely, that's something that really fuels me with the podcast is helping to elevate and promote people who who maybe need a larger global audience or maybe yes. they have a startup and and they have great ideas, but they just need a, a, a little extra extra boost, boost of, of broadcasting. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying like, I mean, I realize I am not the number one podcast in the world or anything, but but I you don't have to be right. Exactly. I have a large enough uh, subscriber base and audience that I mean, even if there was only five people listening, that's still five more people that an artist that's is right. exposed to, you know, obviously, thankfully, there's more than just five, but I'm grateful <laughs> for everybody. And the process of talking about your creative project, the, what your guests go through to talk about what they do is cathartic and creative in and of itself so it refeeds the whole process yes you get it <laughs> and and I love I love doing this so much and being able to See? you know get to know my friends such as yourself in a whole new light yeah I love that you love that and that's all I want for anybody I want people to not be stuck like I was in the early part of my career where I was like, I don't think I want to be a music teacher, but I have all this training now that says I should. I want to be the mentor I had for someone else that said, well, just because you're doing this one thing doesn't mean you have to do it <laughs> forever. Yeah. You're not stuck. It's interesting that you say that because I I had a very similar conversation with that same mentor saying like, oh, hey, this is this is not what I thought I wanted to do. And And that's terrifying. But to have to be that beacon for somebody else through what you do and to just say, I think I needed that that conversation a long time ago. I needed for other people to like, I needed confirmation that I wasn't going to be disappointing them, I guess, or like living to some living up to their expectation in some way. And so to be to be able to say to someone, this is good. Go out into the world and do this. I let I release you is the ultimate confirmation, I guess. A lot of people obviously on social media, you know, trying to make it on their own and using products such as Canva, which is fantastic to make some really mm-hmm. cool colorful graphics, but any one tip or piece of advice for people utilizing social media in whatever way that they can that that you feel like applies. Yes. Yes. So many, but I will try to narrow it down to my top. (laughs) (laughs) I think when people see, when people see a social feed, they see, they assume that what is being fed to them, that what this other person is posting on their social feed is a part of this grand strategy. And it's not because a lot of people are throwing spaghetti at the wall and guessing they do, you know, they take what sticks and move with it. If there's one thing that creating content for other people has shown me, it's that if you were, if you set in mind one goal, just one, and you can't do many, you can't do multiple goals because they all have different tentacles, right? If you set one goal for your social feed, and you work toward that goal, just like anything else, then you will be successful in it. And that is the strategy. The strategy is to have one single goal and create your content to feed that goal. It could be, then people that go into this like, well, I just want to post consistently. That is a goal. (laughs) That is a valid goal. And if you set a plan to post consistently and you achieve it, you know, part of the strategies that I have are success, success metrics for each of these things. And so if you, if consistency or general, I hate to use the word brand, creatives generally hate it, but general brand awareness, that is a goal as well. So behind all of those there, though, there is a strategy and it's worth to set a goal and work toward that. Even if it is as simple as saying out loud, I want to post consistently for six months (laughs) because a lot of people 
I think that is the goal for a lot of people and they just don't voice it out loud or recognize it. And therefore they feel when they are posting and not getting results, they're not reframing it with the narrative of, well, actually I have been posting twice a week for six months and that alone should be the motivator to move forward and, and either with a different goal or with um, uh, a different objective in mind, right? So set a goal. And the second one is to know your audience. <laughs> so a lot of people assume they themselves are their audience. They post something and they wonder why nobody responds, nobody engages, nobody, it doesn't pick up, doesn't, doesn't have traction. And that's because, and it's okay, it's not bad. You can have a social feed that is literally just your own, <laughs> for your own goal. And I have one of these. It is just your stuff for fun. And that is a goal too. Just, I want to post consistently and have fun. This is my video uh, journey toward X, Y, or Z or whatever content it is you're putting out. But that I know my audience when I do that. And the audience was me. Well, a lot of people do not think through that. And they don't think, what am I creating this content for? Who am I speaking to when I share this piece of content on my social feed? What what value are they going to get out of it? And that's all, these are all kind of marketing and communication sphere topics. But uh, when you are posting something and you're not getting the engagement that you want on social media, reframe that narrative and think, well, what was my goal? And you might've already achieved it. And if your other, if your goal is something else, if your goal is to go viral or to get 50 likes on a, on a post or to get 10 reshares, you have to have that call to action in that post in order to achieve that success metric. And in order to do that, reversing that, you have to know your audience. <laughs> a lot of people just assume that if they put a piece of content on social media, that it's fine because you created it. But if it doesn't speak to your audience, it's not going to go anywhere. It could just live and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. I noticed that in terms of things that go viral, it's just like with comedians who get the most laughs on a bit it's something that is relatable and authentic mm -hmm. yes and a lot of people assume when they or when they go to post something on their social feed if you know your audience the authenticity will follow the relatability will follow because you are living that work and if you are speaking to other people who are living that work it's going to resonate with them but you're right, relatability and authenticity. I think those things are byproducts of having a goal and knowing your audience because now you just act and live with those lenses and then whoever is consuming and digesting that information, it will speak to them and it will resonate. And that's, yeah, that's where traction starts to pick up. I had a post, um, a video, I'm sorry, a reel on Facebook go viral and got like half a million views and a, bo a boatload of comments and I don't know it was just a it was a throwaway reel that was the moment when I, I was like oh there's something here and I really tried to pick apart and digest this before this was before I realized like that there's all sorts of content creators that are have hacked the the viral content formula and they know how to do it and now looking back I'm like oh that post I fell into that it was accidental that I made it like changing camera angles I made a 10 second hook and then you know there was like this flow to the reel to the video that made it go viral and it was a throwaway thought that I had about watching the never ending story we were watching the never ending story and there's this scene um, that was like pivotal, I think, to the whole movie. And as an adult, it hit different. I, I did not remember that it was like a wolf saying something about whoever has the, whoever has the power. Like it was a power statement. It was a statement on power, and it hit different as an adult. So I spoke to that. I spoke about that in my reel. I said the never ending story. As an adult, it hits different. And then I showed the video the clip and then I brought it back and I said, yeah, that pretty much sums up the world. And that is what went viral. That's what spoke and resonated to people. And then all of a sudden you have people dumping their life stories in the comments. <laughs> and I realized, you know, anybody else would be like, I don't want to hear this. But actually, I did want to hear it because people had a lot to say about that. People had a lot to say about how power has influenced their lives and how inequity has influenced their lives and it just like that was a light bulb moment for me I'm like that's how you get people to you know that's resonating content 
but it was a throw. I almost just threw it out. And then it did. It went viral later on Instagram. Not as much. I think it got up to like 20,000 views, but like <laughs> I just had no idea. I had no idea. So now I understand. <laughs> But I had never, would never have gotten to that point if I hadn't just posted it, not worried about it, and just shared it because that was that was my goal. That was my goal was not to go viral. My goal was just to share my thoughts. We're going to pivot a little to some fun questions. If we time travel back to sometime in the '90s and it's summer, what CDs are you listening to as you're driving around in your uh, car? Okay, <laughs> okay, Backstreet Boys and In Sync. <laughs> Definitely a Britney Spears. I'm sorry. I was like the most basic child in the 90s. Britney Spears. Um, oops, I did it again. Then there was like this whole 90s movement of like um, like the Lilith Fair genre. So like Sarah McLaughlin, Natalie Cole, Natalie Merchant, I should say. And that kind of like Tori Amos, th- that kind of femme 90s, that, that's who we listen to. And those are like, and then Alanis Morissette, but not the track with the F-bomb that my mom was like, don't listen to this track. <laughs> but yeah, those kinds of things. I'm a, definitely a child of the 90s. <laughs> yeah. I do love the 90s music. Holds a special place in my heart too. <laughs> In terms of inspiration, whether it's music inspiration or um, for your content creating, you know, where do you find, where do you find it? Inspiration for my content? For anything, anything. For anything. So whatever format it is, I'm consuming information, whether it's a blog or a song or a movie, a digital, like a, a movie or even just a reel or a film. That is, those are somebody else's words. And I'm, I'm now realizing that that always inspires something and it's the repurposing of that message into something else and the iterating of that message that inspires me. So for instance, I hear a song lyric in a song from the nineties, if you will, and it brings, it evokes something visually for me. And then I have a whole new story to reiterate And I get to decide what template that goes into, whether it's me speaking into a microphone for a podcast or if it's me putting a very small piece of that as a quote on um, to share on my social feed or it's an entire new song that is needs reiterated and fleshed out. So the inspiration, I think, to me comes from the digital media, but music is a is a big part of that. Right. So listening to other people's stories And then I read a lot of books. I read a lot of other people, like niche stuff that nobody would, (laughs) like the stuff you pick up at a gas station in rural Tennessee that is like the history of a local area kind of thing, because there's all sorts of like really cool anecdotes and stories in those types of books and those resources that evoke a whole new thought process, a whole new imaginary world, if you will. History, anything historical, love going into history museums and history podcasts, a lot of true crime. I'm into a lot of true crime, but not necessarily for the gore of it, but for the story of it and any sort of lens that, I guess, output lens, for lack of a better way of saying it, that uh, magnifies any sort of historical inequity. So um, missing indigenous persons or um, anybody who was marginalized that went missing and now their story is being heard years later because we're paying attention to it as a society, that kind of thing. So yeah, a lot of of digital media, podcast books, true crime. (laughs) It's a mix. Nice. Nice. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that, that is so (laughs) interesting. I, I, I could see you as a true crime fan for sure, you know? Oh, I love it. And anything, anything that does all of that with the tone of humor, that is my camp. Anything that is funny, parenting blogs, anything that does it with that, that makes you laugh because it's so gosh darn relatable. That's, that's my niche. I love that. (laughs) And you may have already spoken to this before, but what is the biggest surprise you've had in the last year? And, um, Is that something you'd love to happen again? In the last year. Ooh, this is real broad, Tammy. Uh, Does having to have foundation work done on my house count? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, biggest surprise. I think I, if we're keeping it with the tone of like constantly surprising yourself for the purposes of creative reinvigoration, I think my biggest surprise is that I I'm in ca- I am capable of any sort of creativity and that that creativity never has to look the same. It just has to feel the same. That's the biggest surprise. It still surprises me, even though I pivot I feel like professionally now for a living, (laughs) it still surprises me and it still reaffirms the create the inner creativity. And, um, and then also if we're getting more specific, I also think anytime I am surprised by something, Oh, this person enjoyed this song of mine. This person reshared this post or this person wants to use this song in this in this specific format, or this person wants to interview me for their podcast. That those are all ongoing surprises for me because at the end of the day, <laughs> I'm still this like insecure little girl, but still doing the same things I did when I was five, eight, 10, 12. It's none of that has changed. So that's still a surprise to me too. In in speaking of limitations and budgets, if we had like a sky's the limit and you had no limitations, what kind of project would you create? This is a, this is going to be hard for me to answer because I have always tried to function within a budget. <laughs> always. And gosh, what? Oh, man. If I didn't have any budget constraints at all, I would probably go, I would probably move somewhere that it doesn't have to be fancy, but it needs to be by a beach. I would move somewhere by a beach And I did, I didn't, I want to say I did this, but I did do this for a month. Like my husband and I took a little beach work vacation, but I would move there permanently and live by the waves. And I would just create shit all day. That's all I would do. I would write songs and publish albums and I would write books and I would do everybody's social media feeds for free because they need it. (laughs) And um, I would just eat my heart out while I did that eat and drink. (laughs) That would be my dream if I had no budget. (laughs) And take lots of walks on the beach. (laughs) And take lots of I I mean, I would walk like every hour. That's what I would want to do. So um, I think (laughs) that vision is very, there are elements of that process that I just described in a much more distilled way in my day-to-day life. Like I do try to walk about every hour. I just pop outside and even just a five minute spurt. And I do eat and drink a lot (laughs) while I create. But I think if there were no budget constraints, I would just do that all all day long, all the live long day. No, that sounds lovely, especially being, you know, by a nice calming beach with the sound of the waves and all that. Yeah. Yeah. What is the biggest sector of the arts that you are curious about right now? I published some music, self-published albums, and I have a pipeline and a strategy for the songs. Like I have about 12 songs that I had wanted to release as singles instead of an album just to experiment with some things. But in that realm, my greatest curiosity right now is sync licensing because I do have friends and I I do have some tracks where I repurposed the background instrumentals, snipped them up into 30, 60 seconds and one and put them up in platforms for purchasing. And for a while I had a background track that was being purchased every month, multiple times a month. And it wasn't a ton of revenue, but it was revenue. And um, it's still doing that. And I'm, my greatest question is, is in that realm. Like I want to sync a song for commercial licenses or like a whole song or like, or sync it to a movie or sync it to a documentary. So that's, and it's a whole realm that I've only just like dabbled in. I would love to go. I would love to know more about. And it's, but it's so niche that I think I would have to go about it in a way that I have not been going about it, which is I create my music and then figure out how to repurpose it for sync and not the other way around where I'm like, here are the themes that people buy for like power anthems and girl power and unity and wholesomeness and those things. And then create songs with that in mind from the get go. So that's my curiosity. It sounds very interesting. And I'm glad that it allows you to create and stay musical in that part of your life. 
Mm -hmm. It feels a little, I don't want to say inauthentic, but because it's not, it's still creativity, but it feels weird to me because I haven't done it before. So I just have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. (laughs) As is life. Yes. So one final question, and that would be, what does living a creative life mean to you? Hmm. I think being happy with whatever your creative output is. That's the ultimate creative life is when you just do it for yourself. Even if it doesn't live somewhere in perpetuity, even if it isn't done and you pushed it toward a final product, but as long as you're happy with what the fact that you did it, that's the creative life ultimately is the process. The more you can strive toward that, I think actually the more successful we feel because by that definition, everything we create is, is a success. Everything we do is, is successful just by nature, just by the act of doing it. I love That's that. it. Yeah. I love that. And that it's such a great mindset because then I think it frees people up from anxieties and yes. perfectionistic tendencies. If they think like, okay, well, whatever I'm doing, it's already amazing because I'm doing it. It's already it. there. It's already there. It, it's valid just by speaking it. It's like copyright. The moment you say something, it is copywritten. (laughs) (laughs) The moment you do something creative, it is valid. There it is. That's it. We should all just live by the U.S. copyright. There you go. There you go. (laughs) They were ahead of their time. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Any last words of wisdom for our listeners before we go? I think just more of the same, which is your story is valid and worth sharing. So share it. There you go. Go forth and create. Go forth and create. That's exactly (laughs) right. (laughs) Excellent. Well, Robin, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yes. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. This was cathartic for me. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. And listeners, please check the show notes for Robin's bio and links for her websites and social media. And if you happen to be in need of a content creator, social media consultant, definitely check her out. She is fantastic. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for Creative Piecemeal Podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.